Thank you, Lord, for responding to our invitation. Thank you for filling the room with your presence. Thank you for making it tangible. It's obvious that you're here with us, Lord. I hear the cries of your people. I hear the clapping of their hands. Some of us have experienced the tears that fall in your presence because of the joy that we have when we remember the mountain of sin that you have forgiven on our behalf to allow us to be a part of your family, to be called children of God. What an amazing privilege it is. Lord, we don't just sing songs here in our church just because they sound good. We want to mean what we say. When we say, Spirit of God, we want to hear your voice and that everything else can wait. We want to mean it. So for those of us that really truly mean that, as we put aside all the, the devices and the phones and the, and the other thoughts that are trying to hold us captive right now and keep us from hearing your voice, we put those things down. We lay them down right now. And we set our eyes afresh vertically. And we, we look up to you, Lord. You said that we should set our eyes on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. And that's where we want to point our eyes right now. And as our eyes go, so will our lives. So will our thoughts. And so that's where we want to go right now. So we do, Lord, we, we invite you to come and speak to us now. We want to hear from you. We didn't come here tonight just to have a good cup of coffee, Lord. We came, legit, we came because we want and need to hear from you, Father. We all have stuff we've walked into. In, in this life, you will have trial and sorrow, but to take heart, for you have overcome the world. We want to hear about this overcoming stuff, Lord. We need, we need your help because we're weary and we carry heavy burdens. And you said if we come to you, you'd give us rest for our soul. Isn't that what we all look for? So, Lord, we just come to you right now humbly. Maybe your head needs to be down. Maybe you need to be sitting. I don't know what you need to be doing, but just to show the Lord, let him see with his eyes your humble posture. Lord, we give in to you. We, we, we cast away all our silly pride and get rid of all that stuff that would get in the way of you speaking to us. Lord, we want to be obedient to your word. We want to submit to your authority right now. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would, would rush through this room like the winds of Pente Pentecost and break down walls of, of stubbornness and rebellion that stand against you, Lord, so that we might hear from you tonight and that you would change our life forever because we met you in this place right here tonight. Take a moment, loved ones, and not listen to the man yelling, but listen to the one who whispers, and then we'll hear his word. have a seat and we are going to jump into God's word I want to welcome uh, all of you that are here I don't know all of you but my man, my name is Moses and uh, one of the pastors here at the church it's good to see everybody I want to welcome everybody who's on Facebook joining us and uh, the Spirit of God can meet you right where you are so even though you're not here in maybe in the sanctuary uh, our God fills the universe with himself and so he can he can meet you right there in your living room on Facebook, and so we welcome you. Uh, not an excuse to blow off church. That's yeah, so you guys rock. But if you're out of town and you need your your fix, you can you can come on Facebook and 
and take a look. Hey, listen, one thing I want to mention to you that we didn't get to in our announcements, it was up there in print, but it's super, super important. On Wednesday nights, we've never had child care, and so there's been some families that wanted to come, but they have kids and they couldn't. So that's been fixed. Last week, I asked, I said, show of hands, I need, I need some people right now, some four faithful servants who would just say, yes, I'll watch kids, and, and we'll just go on this schedule, and, and five people raised their hands. So that's awesome. And that's the way the church should be, right? Everyone should be helping out. We, we do more when we're together. And so from now on, there'll be child care on Wednesday nights too. So we're just trying to get rid of all the excuses that you might have for not wanting to come to church, right? So let me ask you a question. Why is it that uh, over the last eight years of standing up before people, eight years, eight long years, I have stood up, and I don't know what that equates to, because I don't know how many times a, a year I'll take a weekend off here and there, but that's like 400 plus times I've stood before beautiful faces like this and said, open your Bibles too. And let me tell you something, if you go to a church and they don't do that, you need to leave, okay? You need to leave, okay? If God doesn't show up, maybe it's time for you to not show up. All right, so, why, so 400 times or so I've, I've said, open up your Bible. You know, every time someone calls a church and needs some, some counseling, why, why does it always end up that I, I end up saying, hey, have you been reading your Bible? Why, why don't you read your Bible? What, you know, the Word of God says this or that. Like, I don't have some magical, myster, mysterious power that I could, you know, just sprinkle fairy dust on you and make your marriage better or make you stop smoking crack. Like, I can't do that. So what I always do all the time is, hey, have you been reading your Bible? You know that most of the time, I wouldn't say most of the time, I'd say almost every time we put on Lake County Sheriff's Office on our phone and we see one of our loved ones in jail, guess what happened before that? They stopped reading their Bible. They stopped showing up in church. They stopped coming to prayer time. They stopped praying with their husband and their wife. They stopped serving. Why is that? All the time, counseling turns back into, open your Bible. This is what God's Word says. Why is it that when... Someone calls up here and says, hey, preacher, I got this, this kid. They call from the probation office. Hey, this kid's got community service to do. Or a parent calls up, hey, my kid's a knucklehead. He got caught, you know, smoking a little weed and, and, and drinking and, all, you know, all the stuff that, that you all did. And, and nobody? Yeah. Right? A bunch of holy rollers up in here, right? So, so, so why, why is it? That, like, you know what happens at this church when someone says, well, I need to do community service. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that sweeping this floor is going to take a young man who's being a knucklehead and transform him into this awesome member of society. Do you know what does? God. God does. So when they come to do community service, they study the Bible here. I got a kid doing it right now. They come in here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I have him studying the Gospel of John. And then we sit down with his notebook. I make him take notes. And then we go over the, the notes. And we find, so I want God to change this guy. That's the best way to reintroduce someone into the, into the society, right? Productive. That's what we do. All the time. You know, there's lots of things that we can talk about when we gather. We can talk about in church. We can talk about self-help. Right. Self-help is the joke of the century. You know? Self's the problem. Self needs to be crucified on the cross, right? You can't help yourself. How does something broken fix itself? I don't even know how that works. We could talk about self-help and social injustice and mental health issues and time management and political leverage and, and litigation and legislation and economic responsibility, how to, when to, what to, expert here, advocate there. Endless information at our, at our fingertips, isn't there? Hold up your phone. Hold up your phone. I know you all have them out, right? There's a million things on there. Endless, endless information. And we want more and more and more information is available to us. Let me tell you something. I say this from the bottom of my heart with complete sincerity. It's all worthless. Worthless under the overwhelming shadow of God and His Word. 
The rest of it is nothing. Nothing at all. You know, our, our faith statement here at our church is unique. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And, and, you know, when you start a church, you know, what you do is you go on websites and you visit churches and you see what they're doing. And you visit the ones that are packed. Let's just be honest for a second in church, right? Well, you don't go looking at someone's website that can't put 10 people in a room and say, hey, that looks like it'll work. You go to the churches that are working, right? There are people being led to the Lord. They're packing the house, adding services. People are getting baptized, everything. So, so you, you start copying some of their stuff. And, and listen, that stuff right there, that's not, that, nobody owns that intellectual capital any, anyway. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. It's all God's. So you can steal it in the church. People steal stuff all the time in the church. But we didn't steal ours. Ours is unique. I want to share it with you. It's right there. You can look on our Facebook page. But bring that thing up there, Danielle. Can you bring that up for us? No, 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 no. The, the next slide. No, that's not it either. No. Should be. Ah, there we go. There's our, there's our belief statement. You know, most, before you read it, most churches have, we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in, there's no other way to heaven except through Jesus, right? And those things are true. But this is ours. Look what it says. We believe, we believe the Bible is God's word. By the way, I just want to remind you guys something, that this section right here, these tables, yeah, this is the amen section. So I just want to extend an invitation. If you're fired up about Jesus, please come sit here. Fill this. I don't, want any, I don't need loud people in the back. I need them up here. I need you to help me preach the message. So why don't you come up? Nobody? Come on, that's it. That's what I want to hear. And I need you to help out. Get fired up about Jesus, right? Don't be quiet. Don't let the, don't let the Green Bay Packers get all the cheering, right? Let's do a little something here. Fill these tables. Listen, our faith statement is that the Bible is God's word. We believe that with over 7 billion people on this earth, that not everybody is going to believe, worship, pray, serve, give, and practice their Christianity exactly the same way. And that that's okay. Keep reading it. We believe in sharing God's word passionately and completely so that the world will fall in love with Jesus Christ. So our philosophy in a nutshell is this. Read it. The Bible. Open it, read it, and do it. Period. That's what we're supposed to do. The truth is found in God's word. I might be wrong in the way I interpret it. Everybody interprets things. But the truth is in the Bible. And so when we open the Bible and you, find, and you mine the truth out of it, if my truth, Oprah, is different than your truth, don't get on to me about it. Just read the Bible. That's true. Okay? I'm not, always, I'm not God's word. I'm not the gospel. It's right here. So open it, read it, and do it. And so that's, the, that's like the, the, the meat of our church. That's what drives everything that Revolution Church does. I can't speak of any other church, but our church is based on that. Open the Bible, read what it says, and do what it says. Can you imagine if people would just do that? But listen, I don't want to just like give you this, this, this nice little saying. This saying, this open it, read it catchphrase that we have, it has biblical precedence. It has some biblical undergirding. It's, it's derived from God's word, about God's word. And if you're going to be part of this church, if God has called you here, you need to know this. You need to know this. Don't just let me know it. You need to know it. And so my job is to pass this info on to you so that you too could know it. So let's talk about the first thing. Let's talk about open it. Let's talk about open it. It. Open it. It. What is it? It's the Bible. It's the scriptures. It's referred to as God's word, right? People all over the world have it all over their coffee table. And they have it on their dashboard of their car. And they have it on their nightstand, but just like being in a garage doesn't make you a car and visiting the White House doesn't make you the president, owning or displaying or carrying some Bible means nothing. Amen. Nothing. Okay? You got to use that thing, right? You got to use it. If, if you want anything good to happen as a result of owning it, you got to open it, right? You got to open it. So, so but, but, okay. You all agree with that? You gotta open it, right? So, but, 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 but why? 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 I mean, it sounds good. Like, if I, 
Of course you're going to say yes. I asked you, right? So you're going to say, yeah, sure, right? But why? See, we don't, need, we don't need a bunch of dodos in the church. We need educated Christians, smart Christians, aware Christians, right? Not just, hey, the preacher said so, so I'm going to do it. No, no, no. It doesn't matter what I say or do or think, right? Why, why do we spend precious time? You know, time's the only resource you don't get back. You can lose 20 bucks out of your pocket, go back to work, make $20 again. But you can't get back any time, can you? You have a very limited amount of time. So why is it that we would spend our precious time opening this Bible? I mean, what is this book? What is this, this best-selling, most read, most widely distributed, most controversial, most loved, and most hated book in the history of the human race. What is this book? So, so it's our sword. I like that. Careful when you're carrying your Bible, you cut your finger. But listen, there's a lot of different organizations out there that do research, and I'm not saying any one's better than the other. But we're all familiar with the Guinness Book of World Records, right? You look up there and they tell you, you know, this guy, that guy, they did this, they did that. So I'm not just saying that this is like concrete, absolute, like they're the number one authority, but I'll just say this, they're a, good, they're a good source. But the best of their ability, they have determined that the Bible has, sold, has been sold and distributed five billion times. Do you know how much that is? No, you do not. Do you know what a billion is? I couldn't even fathom what a billion is, right? It just sounds so, you know, you say a billion. Awesome. It means a thousand millions. A thousand millions. Five thousand millions of Bibles across the earth, right? That should blow your brain at how many there is. And, and, and here's another one for you. If you add up, that's the number one of the bestseller. If you add up the, the, the selling and distributing of number 2 through 10 and combine it, it doesn't even come close to the Bible. Not even close. Not even close. What is this book? What is this book that we say open it every week and spend so much time in it? Well, on the surface, it's 66 short letters of rules and poetry and, and advice from 40 different pens. 40 pens. It took 3,400 years to put all of this together. From 40 different people in different nations over thousands of years and somehow very congruent. Isn't that amazing? Now, if they wrote it today... That'd be an easy one to pull off. You could scam some people, you know, because if I'm over in Indonesia somewhere and you're over in the, in the Ukraine, we could get on FaceTime. We could get on Skype. We could, we could do conference calls and we could, we could manipulate stuff and we could say, hey, we're going to come up with this new thing and that'd be easy to do. Yeah, this was thousands of years ago. The guy over in this country is writing about this God, and this guy over in this country is writing about the same God, years apart, hundreds if not thousands of miles away, with no communication. Perfect. How does this happen? See, opinions may vary on what the book is. But let me just say, opinions don't really mean much at all. What does this book say of itself is really the question. We need to forget everything else. We need to forget everybody else and stay in the source to find out what it is. Okay? And that's what I want to do with you. What is this book? Do me a favor and turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. Listen, don't just listen to me yapping Get a Bible in front of you. We're gonna, I mean, if we're sitting here tonight of all nights saying open it, read it, and do it, you better be opening it, right? Don't be a slacker. Second Peter chapter 1. It's all the way towards the back of the, of the Bible. If you're using one of our Bibles here, there's the page number on the screen. 
We don't want to spoon feed you so you won't see too many verses on the screen itself because we want to train you to open it and read it and do it, right? So get a copy of God's Word, either you know, a real one here or one of them fake ones on your phone or whatever. You can open that thing up too. 2 Peter chapter 1, look in verse 20. Above all, what does that mean? Important, right? What does that scream? This is important. So, so, so Peter's writing this letter to the churches, that's us, and, and he says, listen, I'm saying all this stuff, but above all, like the most important thing, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. Now, th those prophets were, were moved by the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, and they spoke from God. Pro no, no, no prophecy in Scripture. What is, it, what is he saying? Anyone who ever spoke on the Lord's behalf, right? Isn't that what the whole Bible is? If this is true, that everything that comes from God, then the whole Bible is prophecy. The, these are the, the voice of God to their generation. And they are speaking, but it's not of their own thoughts or, or understanding. No, the Holy Spirit guided them, and they spoke from God. So a prophet, right, is, is, is just this, a spokesperson for God. And, and why, here's the question, why would 40 people all decide in different nations and different times to pen all these influential words in the hope of shaping people's lives and then attribute it to the authorship of it to God and receive no benefit for writing these things unless it were true. And they were just the mouthpiece, not the source. And why would Paul, my, my Bible hero, why would he pen um, 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture, all Scripture, right? That's this. Everything, every bit of this is God-breathed and is useful to teach us what's correct, what's right, what's wrong, get us back on track, right? And God uses it to equip all of his people to do every good work. Why would he say that and then teach that when every time he did it, he got whipped, beaten, persecuted, and put in prison? Why would he do this unless it was true? I mean, would he do this if it's fake and false? Would he, would he claim it as his own writing and maybe get something out of it? Well, if someone did that, I could understand. But he's not getting anything out of it, ever. If the Word of God brought gain to the human pen that wrote it, well, then doubt would certainly overshadow what was written. But no prophet ever gained, ever. Do any study of biblical history. No prophet ever gained. They were whipped, beaten, hated, and often killed for doing this. So let's dive deeper into what it, right here, this book. What is it? Do me a favor and turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. It's going to tell us what this thing is. It's going to say what it is, It's going to tell us what these things that are written are and what they do. Okay? Starting in verse 7, Psalm 19 says, The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. And how many of us can confess right now of being down in the dumps and have something weighing heavily upon us and we didn't know how we were going to get through it and we went into our room and we pulled open God's word and he met you right where you were and brought you fresh faith to live another day and gave you guidance to know what to do with that day. 
right? You've seen it happen before. All of us have experienced this. So God's word is true. Not only does it say it's true, but you've lived it and you know it's true. We, our hearts need to be revived. We get, our souls are down and, and, and hurting. And every time we open God's word, boom, his instructions, his decrees, his commands, his laws, God's word, the whole thing in its entirety. It's all the Bible. It's all authored by God. It's God breathing life into you, the reader. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says that the word of God is alive and powerful. That means it's applicable now. It's relevant now. And it's able to revive the soul, make wise the simple. How many people in here have a PhD from Harvard? Come on. What are you talking about? So we're all simple people? Just regular everyday Joes. Half of y'all came to this church because you were at Home Depot. And you came over here. You were banging nails for some chore or task, honey-do list, building something, everyday Joe screwdriver, and you came walking over here. We're simple folks, right? But the Bible says that it makes wise the simple. And all these truths of what it is and what it will do is available to each and every person who will take that dusty old book, get it off of your dashboard to try to impress everybody, and open the thing and read it. And more people need to be doing that so we can gain something from ownership. See, when we open it, it's because we comprehended its value. We understood what it was. If you don't understand what it is, and you don't appreciate the value of it, you wouldn't open it, right? Hopefully, we've established some clarity as to what it is and what it will do in your life. So, we open it. It is God's words. And then what? Well, we, we read it, right? We don't just flip it open. You guys, you guys ever heard of Pandora's box? Right, that, that, that Greek mythology, you know, the box, and you, and you twist it and turn it, and if you open it, all the evil spirits come out and they infest the, the atmosphere, right? That's not the same as God's Word. You don't just flip it open and all of a sudden all this God juice is going to come floating out and fill the atmosphere. That's not the way that it works, okay? You've got to get it off the pages and into you if you want any benefit from owning it. Joshua 1.8 says, study this book of instruction continually and meditate on it day and night. That doesn't mean let it sit on the dashboard of your car so people will give you an extra space. Maybe they'll see you with the Bible and they'll let you pull into Circle K and give you the way because you're holy. Quit manipulating God. Quit using His Word for your gain. When the real gain is actually opening it and studying it and reading it, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw Herb a bone here. 2 Timothy 2.15. I think we're going to put it up on the screen, please. Yeah, look at that. I did this for Herb because I love you. Look what it says about God's Word. Study to shew. I don't, yeah, whatever. Show. I love you. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But let's keep it up for a second. Approved unto God? Amen. Approved unto God? Well, doesn't he already love me? Yes, he does. If we said yes to Jesus and his provision for heaven, hasn't he just said yes, come on in? Absolutely. But yet, why does Paul say that there's something that we need to do to be approved of God. Not to be lazy or lethargic with the Bible. Not to let it sit on your nightstand and collect dust. right? And not just to, you never go into one of them old crusty churches where you walk in and the, the original Bible is sitting there on the table. That massive thing, it's about the size of that, 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 that subwoofer. It's massive, right? Open it, like that doesn't matter. Right? Study it to be approved unto God. So he could say, Add a boy, add a girl. You know it. Why? You don't want to be ashamed. 
These are hard words from God. It's not just all grace, 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 grace. Study to be approved that you wouldn't be ashamed. I don't want to look, I don't want to look at God and say, oh, I really screwed that one up. I'm so sorry. Is that what you want? If you have an encounter with God, don't you want it to be a good thing? So, so we're to be a workman, right? Work at that thing, right? How many people work 40 hours a week? Show, show your hands. And, and more, right? How many people, don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Don't dare raise your hand. How many people are, are reading the Bible 40 hours a week? Like, no, I'm not telling you need to, and I'm not telling you to raise your hand. I'm just saying we'll work for a paycheck for 40 hours, but God's Word says to work at this thing so you can rightly divide it. How do, you, how do you know what it says? How would you, you know, it says that this is, people say that this is the blueprint for life, right? Anyone ever hear that one? Yeah, how would you know where to go, what to build if you never read it? How, how would, the, how would the, the contractor ever build this building if he never looked at the architect's notes? Work. You work at this thing to show yourself approved, right? You, you, it's not just osmosis. You don't just, you know, you walk in and there's that Bible on your nightstand or on the dashboard of your car or open in the lobby of the church. Look at how awesome and holy it is and all the God fairy dust is floating all around and we're good. No, no, no. It doesn't happen by walking. Well, I just walked next to the Bible. So maybe it's going to jump up. You know, I was reading the Bible and it jumped off the page. Like, don't take that literally. It's not going to jump off the page and attach to you. You've got to actually open it up and read it, okay? A worker rightly handles the Word of God. How many people in here have a tablet, like an iPad or an Amazon, Kindle, Fire, anything like that? Anyone? Raise your hand if you've got a tablet. Okay, do you ever, do you ever put stuff on it? What do you put on that thing? What do you put on that thing? Games? Netflix? That's good. Awesome. You got the Bible on that thing, right? What else? Pinterest? What else do we put on our tablets? What do we write on that thing? Wish, what, music? Awesome, those are great things, right? Tozer books. Hammer, I like that. Listen, we, 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 we use our tablets and we put stuff on it, but here's what God's Word says. Proverbs 7, 3. Write God's Word on the tablet of your heart. Write God's Word on the tablet of your heart, right? We're not just downloading onto our tablets information, but God wants you to write on your tablet of your heart His Word. Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden your word on my heart that I might not sin against you. Right? So do we, do we have the power to not sin? Like, is it, do, can I determine? I'm not going to sin anymore. Like, that's good. We should have, the Scripture says that the Holy Spirit of God gives us the fruit of the Spirit. And one of those things is self-control, right? So we could determine, like, I, I've set my face like stone, determined to do your will, and I'm not going to do this thing anymore, and I'm going to put my, my heel on the, on, the, on the neck of that snake, and I'm not going to, that's awesome, we should do that, but where's the power come to even want to do that? Word of God, good, good job. It comes from the Word of God. I've written your word. Do, do you see the download coming? Do you see it across the screen, the little download thing, right? That's what's happening. He wants you to download his word off of the page and onto your heart so that you'd have the power not to sin. And all these verses that I just read to you, Joshua 1 8, 2 Timothy 2 15, Proverbs 7 3, Psalm 119 11, they're all telling the same story. All of these pens, these authors are saying the same thing that you actually got to read the word of God if you want it to impact you. But that doesn't mean it's the simple skimming. You know, we just skim and check it out. And, and listen, daily Bible plans are, are so nice. And, and, and daily devotionals are good. And Jesus is calling is cute. And your daily verse on your phone, that's nice, okay? But that's not what we're talking about. It's said in Psalm 119 that it's, that it's more desirable than gold or sweeter than the sweetest honey in the comb. And if it's that, then it's to be treated as special, right? You should give it time and focus and attention. So, so when, it, when I read Joshua 1, it says to study this book of instruction, right? Are study and read the same? 
It, it kind no, listen, it is. We take reading as just read it. But that's not what the... Dive, dive deeper into the understanding of God's word and it'll tell you that when you read it, no, it's studying it. Study to show yourself approved, right? A workman, he never says, just read it. That's not what he says. Reading it means studying it, right? Study is the devotion of time. This is just Webster, but it'll give you an idea of what study means. And in light of what it says, you can look at your own time in God's word and measure it according to this. Study is the devotion of time and attention to acquiring knowledge. Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Or are you skimming the page and getting your daily Bible verse on your phone as you're getting ready for work and the pants are going on and the belt's going on and brushing my teeth and I'm Hebrews 4.11, you know, like, that's what a lot of people are doing. Yeah, drive through Jesus, right? Jesus' light. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to encourage you. There's so much more for you that God would have if you would not just do a daily Bible verse on your phone. Like, if that's where you started, awesome. That's junior varsity, though. Isn't it time to move up? Isn't it time to strap on your pads and play big boy football? And not play junior varsity anymore, right? Let's get into God's word. Let's study it. And then it goes on. It says not only to study it day and night, but then to meditate on it day and night. To meditate on it. So in other words, when it's in front of you, you're studying it, and you've got your, your, your Bible open, and your notebook open, and you've got your concordance there, and, and whatever, and, and maybe some commentary, whatever resources you have available, and you're studying it, and you're taking notes, Right? That's the study part. But then at some point, you've got to put it down, right? Because you've got to go to work. You've got to go to the grocery store. You've got to get the kids to school. You've got to do a bunch of stuff, right? That doesn't mean that the study ends. No, that's when you meditate. That's when you start meditating. Okay, I just learned. I'm, 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 okay, let's just say, for instance, I'm reading Psalm 19, and I'm re- I'm, 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 I'm dedicated this morning to studying verses 7 through 10. Preacher talked about it. I'm going to get clear understanding of what it means, taking some notes, jot down the references, and then after I get in my car, now I'm starting to think about this stuff. I don't just leave it there on my study in my little private spot where I left the Lord. You take him with you. And you start thinking about these things. Studying it means you want to understand what it means. Meditating means what's it mean to me. What does that verse mean to me? How does it impact my life? Where am I falling short of this thing? Where am I excelling in this thing? Because God will give you a praise. He'll say, out of boy. He'll say, out of girl. Maybe he just wants to give you a little guidance. So we meditate on it day and night. Why? It goes on to say two reasons. To ensure obedience. You see the do it start to sneak in here a little bit. We don't just study God's Word to know what it says. We study God's Word so we know what to do. And then, it all, now here's where we can get a little selfish, but it's not really selfish because God is in His Word and He wants to do things for you. He says, if we meditate on it day and night, we'll ensure obedience and only then, someone say only then, only. will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And there's not a person on the face of the earth that wouldn't raise their hand and say, I want that. Of course we do. We want to prosper in everything we lay our hands to. We want our marriages to prosper, our friendships to prosper, our business to prosper, our relationship with the Lord to prosper. Everything we want to do well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't step into it and go, man, I just can't wait to fail. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> you want to do well, right? And so the Bible tells us, right? Here, it opens up the curtain to some, some real revelation. If you want to succeed in everything you do, only this way. And so many of us are working more and working harder and self-help and reading books and, and give me advice and I'm sending vibes your way. How do you send a vibe? He said, only then. Only then means that this is the only way and it disqualifies every other way to see you prosper. So it just kind of it narrows it. Does it? Can't you just breathe? Like, oh, that's it? That's it. 
How many people have failed in their life in something? Raise their hand. Do you know, I can say this with absolute confidence, if you had done what that Bible in front of you said to do, you wouldn't have failed. And you all know it. My job is to try to inspire you to do it. Right? Just do it. Just do it. Again, Psalm 1, first three verses, same exact thing. Why? Is it because God forgot? No, he wants to like, press this in on you. He wants, to, he wants this to, to bear its weight on you like, so it'll change you. The same thing again. Joshua says it in his book, but then David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God breathed, useful to teach, useful to correct, right? He says, oh, the joys. Anyone want joy up in here? I do. Right? Hey, okay, so here it is. Here's how you get it, okay? If you came looking for joy, God's going to deliver it to you right here, right now. And the only thing that's going to keep you from not experiencing it is who? You. Here it is. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Stand around with sinners, join with mockers. Okay, so in other words, there's joy if you don't act the fool with the fools. We get that. But let's just, if you, if you wouldn't, mind humoring me let's just pull the negatives out of there for a second place them over here because it's common it kind of divides it into two different things like there's joy if you don't do this stuff okay we got that let's pull that out and let's just read it again without that stuff oh the joys of those who delight in the law of the lord what's that mean value i appreciate it I value it. I'm happy about it. I'm not avoiding it. I like it. I'm I'm spending my resources on acquiring it. I'm opening my book. I'm not finding it on a phone somewhere that someone else spoon fed it to me. I'm listen, you could learn on your own. You don't even need me. Do you understand? You can actually applaud that. You don't need me. Everything that I would do here should only be supplemental to what you're gaining on your own. He's given you the mind of Christ if you're a believer. He's given you his spirit inside of him to make you understand what it says. You just got to open it and read it and do it. That's it. Oh, the joys of those who delight in the law of the Lord meditating on it day and night. There it is again, right? They're like trees planted along the river, bearing fruit in every season, and their leaves never wither. This is an agricultural thing, a natural thing, and you're not trees, I get it. But don't you ever have seasons in your life where you feel like, My faith is dry. My relationships are dry. I feel like Israel out in the desert over and over. I'm not getting anywhere. Nothing's going well. There's no fruit being bare in my life. I'm not not prospering in anything that I do, right? You ever been there? Bless you. Here's your answer. The ones who are delighting in the the law of the Lord and are meditating on it day and night, they're like a tree planted by the river. They're like a weeping willow, you know, that's the roots are going down into the water, so they never dry out. Those leaves are never withering. They're never dry and dead. They're sucking up nutrients all the time. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But attached to them, man, you can do everything. Ask for anything in my name, I'll give it. Right? Bearing fruit in every season. Oh, and here it is again. And they prosper in all that they do. So reiterate it again. Such is the life of the one whose mind is stayed on God's word. You know, uh, last week I had the privilege of traveling up to Chicago to meet some dear friends of mine. And it was such a good time. And I, I love my dear brother and sister in the Lord, Kyle and Jamie DiGiacomo, and their two little baby girls. Got to spend two days with them. And it was such a blessing to me. And uh, we're going to go up there and see him again in October. A couple of us here at the church, we're excited we're going to go up there and, and we're going to go to this amazing conference and we're going to get fired up for Jesus afresh. But anyway, I, I was in the airport in Orlando and, and if you've ever gone to the Orlando airport, you know what you see. Just, it just madness. Right? 
They're all coming to see the rat. And, and they want to see Mickey Mouse. And the place is just packed all the time. And I was, you know, I'm working on this message for y'all, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm actually, I hate to say this, but I went to the Burger King line, because I eat Burger King all the time, because I'm here. So I'm like, I'm sick and tired of Burger King, but there was Burger King. Like, what else am I going to do? If you get anything else in the airport, you need to get us a loan. So, so I get a burger, and I'm, I'm in line getting ready to, to get a burger at, at Burger King, and I'm thinking about this, about how we're supposed to be meditating on it day and night, right? And I was looking around as I'm waiting. I was like five deep before I could get up there. And I'm looking around, and I'm, I'm just looking at all the people, and I'm like, man, there's like thousands of people here, man. I wonder if any of them are thinking about the Lord right now. I mean, I don't, they might have been. I I don't know. I'm not judging them because I don't know. But I was just thinking about that. Like, I would say probably most of them are probably not because you're traveling and you've got to make your gait in time and you're hungry and the kids are driving you crazy. And and I shared a little bit about this this past week in the church. You know, I, I was going down to my gate. And I saw one person that was, he had his mind set on God. He's not the same God that you and I worship. He was a Muslim, and he was on his knees, and he was bowing down, and he was praying to his thing. I don't believe that he's praying to anybody, honestly, but he can do what he wants. People that saw that were probably praying a lot. <laughs> they might have been a little bit nervous that he was going to blow their plane up or something, because that's how crazy we are. And we judge, and we look at people and stereotype and all that. But he's the only one that I saw that actually was doing anything that would resemble thinking about any God, any religious form at all. So all these people, I'm wondering, I wonder how many of them are actually thinking about God right now or his word. And I understand that they're probably not, but then I also understand that it just says here that we're supposed to do that. They were supposed to study it. We're supposed to meditate on it day and night so that everything we do will prosper. And I wonder how many people that are Christ followers go hours and hours, if not days, and never think about what they read, if they read it at all. Again, I'm not here to shame or shun. I'm just challenging you to something higher and something better And that God would have so much more for you if you would literally do what it says. You know? God's Word is not a novel to be read for entertainment. It's not some periodical like People Magazine to be glanced over to look at the pictures and see what's happening now. And it's not a sleeping pill. I would just ask you, because I love you, do me this favor. If you ever feel inclined to tell me that you read it at night because it helps you go to sleep, please tell Pastor Ramon or Jeff. Don't tell me. Like, I don't want to hear it ever for the rest of my life. It's not a sleeping pill. It's supposed to be reviving you, right? Not putting you to sleep. It's the, in, it's the in, inerrant, perfect words of the Almighty disclosing some of his mystery to his creation. You know, the, 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 the lions on the, on the plains of Africa, they don't have that. The birds, the, the eagle that soars and we admire, like they don't have that. They can see what's going on and maybe, maybe, maybe they, maybe they, I don't know what an eagle thinks and I don't know what a lion thinks. Maybe there's some type of comprehension of some creator that they would think. I don't don't know what they think, but I know they don't have the word of God that discloses mysteries of who he is to his creation. We're blessed and, and let's just say we're lucky people, okay? We're lucky people. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable to them. But we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us. You know, people are so, a good buddy of mine recently asked me, what, what, what did Jesus write in the sand? Anyone ever curious about that? 
Anyone ever wonder? What did, what did Jesus write in the, you know, when he's down in that, what was it, when the lady was caught in adultery? And he's down on his knees, and, he's, and they all come, and they're going to whip rocks at her and kill her, and he's just kind of chilling because that's what Jesus does. He's not flustered by much. And he's just writing something in the sand, right? And through the generations, people have wondered, man, what? What is he writing? Did you ever wonder that? Yeah, who cares? If he wanted you to know, he'd tell you. And we're sitting there wondering and spending time wondering what wasn't written when we don't even give a flip about what is. Until you master what is written and disclosed and revealed, why are you wondering about what isn't? You're not even accountable to that, but you are accountable, you and your children, forever to what's been revealed. So I'd say it's time to maybe get to work a little bit. Reading means studying and meditating. Diligently mining truth from the Word of God so it can transform every single thing that you do, every way that you think, knowing and believing all the while that it's going to be good for you. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, Deuteronomy 29, 29 carries with it an assumption. I don't know if you caught it. It says, let me read it to you again. The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them, but we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us. Uh, Why? So that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. Do you see that? Do you see the assumption? It's kind, of uns- it's kind of hidden a little bit, shrouded. It's not the main push of the whole thing, but it's there. There's an assumption that as you learn God's word, right, that you're supposed to actually uh, do something about it, right? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, I, I, I quoted to you earlier, that, that every word of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful to teach us how to live. I get that, right? And then it says, and God uses it to prepare and equip all of his people to do every good work. So you don't study it to learn it. You don't just study it to memorize it. You study it what? To do it. It says that we're supposed to do it, right? And that's the third thing. We are supposed to open it, recognize its value and what it is, study it and meditate on it, and then we're supposed to actually do what it says. You know, churches and pastors, including the one you're listening to right now, are usually pretty good at describing the stories of old, you know, regurgitating the stories that they've heard over the years. And once in a while, we'll quote, you know, Greek and Hebrews just so you can be impressed at how smart we are. And we're really good at learning stuff, aren't we? We're all really good at learning stuff. That's what we do now. We want to learn stuff. Learn, learn, learn. That's the reason why people buy these phones and such, so they can learn more and more stuff. And every single weekend... Uh, we get together, we, we congregate in churches, and we, and we learn, right? More learning, more knowing, more information, and, and that's good, right? That's good. And, and as a matter of fact, the Bible has verse after verse that says that it's good. It tells us to gain wisdom and to grow in our knowledge and gather understanding. So we should come here every single week. And you should hear God's word proclaimed to you so you could gain understanding and gain wisdom and gain knowledge. You should do that. And you should plug into a rev group so you could further your understanding and further your wisdom. Like you should be doing that as we meet in homes like they did in Acts chapter 2. And you should come to the Bible study on Sunday nights. You know that, did you guys all know that we go through the Gospel of John verse by verse right here on Sunday nights at 4 o'clock? Did you know that? You should come to that thing because you should learn. You should gain wisdom. You should grow in your understanding and knowledge. But if it ends with the learning, that's epic failure. It's epic failure. So when you look at the last words of Jesus Christ and what we would call, he didn't call it this, but we do, the Great Commission. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. What does that mean? He's the last guy you should be listening to right there. Nobody else. He's the final authority. If he says it's okay, it's good. 
And if your mama tells you no, say, sorry, mama. If your wife or your husband says no, sorry, wife, husband. Jesus says, I'm the boss. And I'm telling you, listen, disciples, I'm telling you, go make disciples. Right? Go make disciples. That means lead them to the Lord. Tell them about Jesus. Lead them in prayer. Start the relationship with Jesus, with these people. And then baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then teach them, listen, this is the part we miss, and teach them to obey all that I've taught you. Churches are really good at saying, hey, this Bible verse says this, this Bible verse says that. And we tell the stories and we say what it says, and that's really awesome. But if you want to be a prophet to your generation, you can't just quote the verses. You've got to tell them, go do it. Someone has to stand up and say, this is what it says, now go do it. And no one does this. Soft serve, easy on feelings, don't offend, don't push anybody. Do what it says. Because Jesus said, teach them to obey. Not just teach them what I said. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. Right? James chapter 1 verse 22 says, don't just listen to it. Do it. You know, I've been doing this for years and years. And I can tell you, over the years, I can, I can see their faces right now of those that would come into this church and every single week, I would say, open your Bibles. They would sit there stubborn with their legs folded and their arms folded. And I'd say, open up your Bibles, open up your Bibles. And I'd even embarrass them. They wouldn't open up their Bible. And they would sit and they would listen to me, but they wouldn't ever do what it says. Guess where they are now? Crash all the time. I'm saying this because I love you and I don't want your life to crash. When the Bible says to do something, you do it. And and you expect something good to come out of that. All things work together for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. That means you do what he says to do to get what he says he wants to give. And there's no way to circumvent the system. He says, don't just listen, but do it or else you're deceiving yourself. What does that mean? Well, I don't know exactly what James said in the moment. I don't know exactly what he was referring to there. But I do know this. Jesus said that someday some folks are going to look at him and say, well, Jesus, I cast out demons in your name, and I did this in your name, and that in your name. And he's going to go, who are you? Not like who are you, like he doesn't know who you are, because he's the sovereign king of the universe. He kind of knows. But like... You're deceiving yourself, bro. You, you think you're a Christian? And all these years I've been telling you what to do and you won't do it? And then you call me Lord? I'm not your Lord. Your football team was your Lord. Your cable was your Lord. Your wife was your Lord. Your kids were your Lord. Their soccer practice was your Lord. Your closet with all your stuff in it, in it was your Lord. Your church was your Lord. But I wasn't. And that's what I think James is talking about. I don't know if that's true. There's the Bible. This is just me. But I think that's what he means. You say you're a Christian. You're just deceiving yourself. Christ followers follow Christ. And if you're not opening it, reading, and then doing what it says, you're deceiving yourself. Thinking that you're something that you're not. And assuming you're going to go somewhere that you're not. And I'm screaming at you now from my heart because it breaks my heart that people are going to go to hell today because they won't heed this word. We need to do what it says or else we're just deceiving ourselves. I know we don't earn salvation by obeying. We earn it by Jesus Christ on the cross paying for your sin. The one who knew no sin became sin, so in him you become the righteousness of God. And you have to believe him, what he did, and embrace him by faith as your Lord and Savior for your sin payment. That gets you saved. But once you get saved, as his, and he's your Lord and Savior, the Scriptures say that God has made this Jesus both Lord and Savior. You can't be Savior without Lord. You can't be Lord without Savior. It's one person. It might be two titles, but it's one dude. And so if you want Him to be your Savior, He better be your Lord. And so we have to do what He says, or else we're just deceiving ourselves. So let me just talk briefly 
to those that have an expression of Christianity that's pretty boring. And some of you probably experienced that. Like, my Christianity is not exciting. It's not an adventure. It's not fireworks and crazy and awesome. And I don't really experience anything incredible. It's kind of boring. I believe it. been going to church for a long time. My parents told me I should. But I'm not really the one who's seeing God do big things, Bible things, ancient things, crazy things, right? And because we're not seeing and experiencing these things, then reading the Bible and going to church, kind of optional. You know, a little overtime and the few bucks that that would bring, well, that outweighs possibly having an encounter with the sovereign king of the universe. And that's common and rampant in our culture. So sometimes you come and sometimes you don't. And you come not because you've experienced something powerful, not because you've experienced amazing things with God, but because other people have. And over the years, people have experienced great things with God. They have an amazing relationship with God. And they come and they're loudmouths about what God will do. And so they preach it and they tell people. And so you come to church because it was awesome for them. And you read your Bible a little bit because it was awesome for them. They had an experience that was powerful. And so they tell you, hey, reading your Bible and going to church, that's good. It's commonly believed that going to church and reading your Bible is good, right? Everybody, everybody knows that. And so we come to church because we hope that it's contagious and if Kim's got an awesome thing with the Lord and she's all, woo, Jesus, man, I'm hoping that maybe if I just kind of walk by her, whoa, woo, woo, it's contagious. Maybe I'll feel something there. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll catch it if I go to church. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. See, when you're in church, even right now, there's two groups of people. There's the group of people that have experienced his goodness and his power and his love and his comfort and his provision. It's what Jesus said, the abundant life. There's those of us that have experienced that. And then there's the other group, the ones that haven't, the ones that don't. And the challenge for, that I'm putting before you tonight is, would you decide what group you want to be in once and for all? Just decide which group you want to... Do you want to come to church because other people think it's awesome and maybe you'll catch something? Or maybe you want to be the one who has something and is telling people how awesome it is. You decide which one you want to be, right? See, you can hear about his strength, hear about how strong he is, or you can experience it for yourself. And I would covet that for all of you that you would experience it yourself. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth, looking to show himself strong to those whose hearts are completely his. That's, that's who he's going after. He's going to show himself strong. You're going to experience the power, the love, the provision, all that his promises have for you if you are totally in on him. He's going after those people. He's not going after the lazy and the lethargic and the complacent and the open your Bible. No, I won't. Do what it says. Never. I'm boss. He opposes the proud. Brings grace to the humble. You choose which group you want to be in. Once and for all. So as we finish up here, I just want to say this. Come on up, guys. And lead us. What if all these claims in the Bible, about the Bible, just what if, what if they're true? I mean, I'm, I'm a preacher and y'all pay me to do this, so of course that's what I'm going to tell you. But what if they were really true? What if, forget what Moses says, but what about what, if, what, about what the Bible says? What if what it says is true? That it's the perfect, powerful, true living words of the Creator and that careful, consistent study, meditation, and obedience to it caused, listen, caused the sovereign King of the universe to stop 
and show himself strong to you. What if that was the case? Wouldn't you want that? All of us would. I mean, for real, right? What if I'm right? What if the knucklehead up here is actually right about this Bible? What if the Bible and, and going to church were, were good because they were profitable for you? Not necessarily profitable for other people, and they're screaming, hey, you should go to church. You should read your Bible. But maybe, what if they, were, what if they became profitable to you, and you started to do it, and you saw the strength of the Lord pouring out into your life where you have never experienced it before? Maybe you're the one telling people about him. I mean, if simply believing in Jesus kind of buys you the ticket to eternal heaven, which we all would believe if we're Christians, you believe that. So is it so hard to believe that if we actually open it, read it, and do it, that that could actually make your life amazing and exciting and filled with purpose and feel full of that abundant life if we would actually do what it's... I mean, like, on, don't raise your hand. Who's actually doing that? At most, at most, it's like the, the paid the paid ministers who are paid to do that all day. Like, and that's a maybe. Because I don't even do that all day. You'll pay me to do it. I'm not sitting there meditating on it all day long. I wonder why things don't go so smooth for me. Duh. But who's actually doing this? Like, Forget the pastor or the pastors. What if a whole church did this? What if we were a people that literally did what this said? Like you heard that word tonight and you know that's for me. And I've been on the fence with God and I read it on occasion. And I, I, I do my, and the preacher was making fun of me because he must be looking at my window because that's how I do my daily verse. I'm putting on my pants, I'm brushing my teeth, putting on my deodorant, I'm trying to look at my phone while I'm driving just so I can punch the ticket, say that I did it. Is that studying the Word of God? Is that meditating on it day and night? Is that, and then doing what it's, how can you even do what it says if you only spent like three minutes reading it real quick? You just need to get it out of the way before you get to your real work. Heaven help us with the way we handle the Word of God. He said, be a workman unashamed who's able to handle the Word of God. There's a way to handle the Word of God. And, and I would just ask that you would consider handling it differently than you have in the past. If you're not someone who's ever really read the Word of God, maybe your Christianity is boring because of that. Let me tell you something. For those of us that have been obedient to that crazy book, and we do what it says, is life boring? Crazy, right? crazy it's an adventure it's a journey it's fun sometimes you cry sometimes you laugh I will tell you one thing if you open it read it and do it you will discover emotions you never thought you had you will love people like that you never thought you could love you'll do stuff you never thought you could do as God will show himself strong to you if you'll give him your whole heart go after him Jeremiah 29 11 we all know but 29 12 says if you seek me with your whole heart you'll find me that's what he's looking for come on let's stand up come on come on come on come on I feel like singing I feel like he said if, if, if you if you'll take that word of God be a workman a workman I will no no I misquoted I'm sorry the eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth what's that mean he's doing it right now right isn't he doing it right now the eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth looking to show himself strong to those whose hearts are completely his put these lights down let's sing okay listen we're gonna sing strong God we're gonna sing about a strong God and if you want him to show himself strong in your life put your hand up to the strong God and invite him to come to you right now okay let's sing to him come on <laughs>